Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. We're delighted to have you here to worship the Lord with us today. If this is your first time joining us here at Grace, we want to give you a very special and warm welcome. We're delighted that you are here today. Let me give you a few announcements about today and the coming weeks. Uh, we do not have our children's church ministry today. That will be uh, available later in the summer somewhat, uh, and then back in full force come September with our regular schedule of services. So uh, please uh, be aware of that. We will be having our Zoom prayer meeting tonight at 7 o'clock. This is in lieu of our evening worship service. That will begin again in September. Uh, but for now, we're having our Zoom prayer meeting, and I hope you can join us online for that. Uh, we thank those who participated a week or so ago in the APS Walk for Life. If you would still like to support and donate to Akron Pregnancy Services, there's information in your bulletin for that. Please put on your calendar our new members luncheon. We will be having a picnic luncheon here in just two weeks on June the 6th. And uh, if you can bring uh, food to share, if you prefer just bringing your own individual meal for yourself, that's fine, no problem at all. Uh, we have been asking for people to volunteer to host small groups as we uh, reinvigorate our small group ministry here post COVID. Uh, we are looking for folks who would be willing to host a group. Now, I should make it clear that uh, your willingness to host a group does not mean that you are committing yourself to doing something uh, every month in your home. We just need a starting place. And a small group may choose to rotate between homes, uh, share that responsibility. Uh, that will be, be up to your group. But if you're willing to be a starting place for us, uh, please let us know. Now, let me say a little something about the mask mandate because uh, my email earlier last week seemed to have been a little bit confusing. I tried to clarify it with a second email and I cannot believe that my crystal clarity and my impeccable logic was lost on you, but nevertheless, <laughs> I apologize that, that it was a bit confusing. The mandate, according to the governor, is that now if you are fully vaccinated, uh, you do not have to wear a mask. So that's starting today, no problem whatsoever. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. If you're fully vaccinated by next Sunday, you don't have to wear a mask. But starting June 2nd, the, the mask mandate is lifted from, uh, for everyone. So no one will be required to wear a mask uh, that first Sunday in June. Now, let me just say a word. I want to reiterate what I put in the email earlier this week, uh, and that is uh, how much I appreciate uh, the attitude that all of you have had about this and in helping us with this. From the beginning, uh, the elders have felt uh, that the mask mandate uh, was basically a Romans 13 principle of submitting to those in authority over us, whether we necessarily agreed or disagreed uh, with the policy. So. Uh, you folks have just demonstrated a remarkable attitude. And uh, as your pastor, and I know I speak for all of the elders, uh, I'm deeply grateful for that. Thank you for that. I have friends who have told me basically horror stories of, of having to, to deal with this in their churches and it causing division. And it's not done that here. And I praise God for that. And I thank you for that for, from the bottom of my heart. Those are all of the announcements that I have for you at this time. Let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship. Uh, let's bow before God. Let's meditate and pray and ask for the presence and help of the Holy Spirit. Please stand if you're able to uh, for the call to worship. Today's passage is from Psalm 89. Join with me. Uh, 
Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For, For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord? With your faithfulness all around you. Let us go before the Lord for this morning service. Father God, we, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your day. We thank you for, for the beautiful weather and the fact that we can gather together with the saints. Gather together with your people who you have purchased, Lord. We thank you that because of Jesus Christ, your son, you hear our prayers. And that we can come before you in confidence and faith and joy. Lord, we ask that you would well with us, that you would guide us. Uh, we know very well that we can do no good aside from you, Lord. That includes worshiping and praising you. We ask, Lord, that you would help us and guide us by your Holy Spirit, that you would guide the, the anointing of, of Rhett and the preaching of your word, and that you would open our hearts to be changed by it, Lord. This is our, our true wish. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> and now here the bidding to repentance. Uh, from also from Psalm 28. To you, O Lord, I call, my rock, be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Let us join together in reading the corporate confession of sin and may it be our prayer uh, as we go before the Lord this morning. Merciful and compassionate God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are the great God who keeps your covenant of love with all who fear you. Today we acknowledge that we have not listened to your word as we should. We have not obeyed your law with our whole heart, and we have wandered into the paths of sin. We have done what was right in your precepts. Now, O Lord our God, we look to you that we might be cleansed from our sin. Purge us from all iniquity. Wash us, and we shall be whiter than snow. Please hear our confession for the sake of Jesus our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now hear the good word. The assurance of pardon from Lamentations 3. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Because of God's great faithfulness, we come to him in prayer this morning. We have so much to be thankful for. It is so wonderful to see Gwen here today. That is just absolutely amazing. After such major surgery now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we thank the Lord for his faithfulness. And uh, we are so glad to see all of you here today. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, we confess that the earth is yours and the fullness thereof. Lord, you own the world and those who dwell in it because you are our creator. Because of your sovereign power, through your sovereign power, you spoke all things into existence. And by your word, they were created. We thank you that we come to worship you today through our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who in the beginning was with God and was God, and by him all things were made. Lord, we thank you this morning that as we come to you, we can come in Jesus' name. When the psalmist David asked, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? And responds that it's the one with clean hands and a pure heart. Lord, we realize how unclean we are, how impure we are. And so we approach you today through the once for all complete sacrificial work of our blessed Redeemer. And we thank you that through Christ, 
We have access into the holiest places of all that he has entered there before us, sprinkling his atoning blood. And now at your right hand, he presents himself as our intercessor. And we pray that today, Father, through the intercessory work of Christ at your right hand and through the intercessory work of the Spirit who dwells within our hearts, hear us, we pray. Help us as we come to you this morning and confess our ignorance. We do not know how to pray as we ought. We do not know how to pray for certain things as we ought or in any way as we should. But we thank you for that ministry of the Spirit who dwells within us and makes those groanings that are too deep for words. And we thank you for the assurance that he is heard, that Christ is heard. And that because you hear the prayers that we offer through the Spirit and through the Son, you work all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to your purpose. And so help us to rejoice today in all that you are doing in and through us. We come today, Father, to pray for our congregation. We have so much to be thankful for. We thank you for our sister Gwen's successful surgery. We pray with thanksgiving for Frida's uh, successful recovery from the, the second ablation on her spine. We praise you, Lord, that you are healing our brother Mark Gidley and Mark Carroll as well. We ask that today you would watch over our sister Erin uh, as she will soon deliver uh, their third child. Watch over and protect her and this baby. Give her a safe delivery and a healthy child, we pray. We Lift to you today in our prayers, our family of the week, and thank you so much for Mike and Hannah and Little Miracle. Thank you for the ways in which you have moved in providing for them and directing them to a new ministry. And we pray for their upcoming move, that you will grant them safety, and in their ministry you will grant them faithfulness to serve you and abundant blessing through them. Do remember, Lord, the ministry of our ushers. We thank you for those who serve us in that way. Perhaps uh, often uh, a job that's uh, done uh, that others think may be little of, but so important. We thank you uh, for those who are a part of this ministry and ask that you will bless them for it and for their desire to serve you here at Grace. We also want to remember today our missionaries, S and C. Father, as they serve in a secure area, uh, an area that can pose danger to them because of their witness for Christ, we simply lift their initials to you, knowing that they are your son and daughter, that their family belongs to you, and that you're watching over them and protecting them. And we ask, Lord, as uh, they face the difficulties of serving you during this time of COVID and travel restrictions, that you will open the way before them and show them the next way in which they are to serve the people of the field to which you have called them, lead them and guide them in a plain path. We do pray for our nation today. We pray for our president and all those in positions of authority over us, both on the federal and the state and local levels. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will give us uh, submissive hearts to those that are in authority because there is no power that is, that exists, that has not been ordained by you. And we pray, Father, for our nation. We pray for you to revive our nation, revive the churches of this nation. We pray for a recovery of the truth. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for the ways in which the gospel has been compromised where we have had itching ears, simply longing to hear a message that suits our tastes, where we have looked at worship as though it were a Sunday buffet and we could just pick and choose as we like. Lord, we ask you to give us in this nation true repentance, that we might turn back to Holy Scripture as your inspired and inerrant word, and that you, through the power of the Spirit, will use your word as your powerful instrument to draw us back to yourself and to work in this land in a mighty and powerful way. We come to you this morning because you have invited us 
And we come to you because you have assured us that your ear is not too heavy to hear and your arm is not too short to save. And so hear our prayers today. And stretch out your hand on behalf of your church. For we ask this in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. stick around Grace Church for very long, you will know that one of our great passions is missions. Uh, we love our missionaries, we support our missionaries, we have sent missionaries from here, and uh, we have asked the Lord to make us a sending church. We don't want to just 
pray for missionaries and support them, but to actually raise them up here in the congregation and send them out. We recently had the joy of sending the keys, uh, not to the foreign field, unless you consider Burbank, California pretty foreign, uh, but uh, they are there now at New Life Church, uh, pastoring a PCA congregation. And what a joy it is to see folks uh, trained and prepared and sent out to serve the Lord. Uh, today, uh, we are sending another family. And you're going to have to forgive me if I get emotional about this. Mike and Hannah, Keith, and their little daughter, Miracle, this is their last Sunday. They are going to be doing home missions. Uh, they'll be moving to the Fairmont, West Virginia area where they'll be working through day spring camp and along with uh, Pastor David Eads and a church plant there. And uh, God has called them to uh, be a part of that work. And they are uniquely gifted and called for that. Um, I was just in their home a couple of weeks ago with one of our elders and their passion and sense of call is just so clear. You, you just, I told them I'd love to just chain them to the chairs here and keep them. If I could do that, I would. They've been such a, an important part of this congregation. Uh, but when you see the passion and the calling, uh, you can't stand in their way. You've got to say, go, and the Lord bless you, and you will be sorely, sorely missed. I'd like to ask the keys if they would come up here for a moment, please. On Easter Sunday, a little miracle told me I was handsome. <laughs> and I need to keep you from my ego. Would you come to me? <clears throat> Mike and Hannah, we love you both so much. And this little one, there are no words. We send you with our blessing, with our prayers, with our love with our words of come come home quickly <laughs> to visit please uh, but we also want to send you with this bag of cards and notes of thanks and appreciation and i want to pray for you father in heaven we thank you for this dear family that you have saved and you have called to serve you Thank you for the gifts that you have given them. Thank you for the passion that they have. And Lord, as they go, may they go in the fullness and power of the Spirit to serve you. We pray today for Pastor Eads and the church plant. We pray for Day Spring Camp, that ministry of our mission to North America. And ask that, Lord, through the outreach of the gospel and through acts and deeds of mercy and kindness, you will draw the hearts of men, women, and children to you. Lord, use the keys, not only to provide for the physical needs of people, but for their spiritual needs. Use them to minister to the outcast and the broken and the needy, the grace that they have received. Lord, as they go to pour out the grace of Jesus through their lives, honor that witness and ministry with your abundant blessing. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I want to invite all of you to stay afterwards today. Uh, set up outside. You will find cupcakes and coffee. So stay, us, stay with us for cupcakes, coffee, and, and maybe a few tears. But uh, we would love for you to be a part of this time afterwards. All right? I love you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was baptized there. Maybe she wants to start doing that herself. <laughs> Will well, you turn with me this morning to Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians? This will be our New Testament reading as we begin today. Second Thessalonians. We're going to commence our reading about midway through or 
two-thirds of the way through chapter 2, and we're going to read down into a few verses in chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, this is the word of God. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of God may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we commanded. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And now, our Old Testament reading this morning is found in the first book of Moses, the book of Genesis, and we're returning this morning to the 31st chapter, Genesis chapter 31. We're going to read this morning from verse 22 down to verse 54. And again, I'll ask you to pay very close attention because this is the living and inerrant word of God. When it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him for seven days and followed close after him into the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country, and Laban with his kinsmen pinched, pitched tents in the hill country of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs with tambourine and lyre? And why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob either good or bad. And now you have gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two female servants, but he did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, Let not my Lord be angry, for I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. So he searched, 
but he did not find the household gods. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? For you felt through all my goods. What have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us. These 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried. And I've not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was. By day the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you for fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, and the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters and for their children whom they have borne? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar and Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones, and they took stones and made a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Yegar Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, he named it Galid and Mizpah, for he said, the Lord watch between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. If you oppress my daughters or if you take wives, Besides my daughters, although no one else is with us or no one else see, God is witness between you and me. Then Laban said to Jacob, see this heap and pillar which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness and the pillar is a witness that I will not pass over this heap to you. And you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me to do harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. And Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to eat bread. They ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. May the Lord himself add his own blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands Our Father, as we come to you this morning, we ask now for your guidance so that we might read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest your truth. We confess today that Holy Scripture is the Spirit's instrument to mold us and make us. And so we present ourselves before you this morning. You are the potter. And we are the clay. Shape us as you so choose into the image of your Son. For we ask in his name. Amen. Several years ago, I was on a flight out of Newark, New Jersey for Tel Aviv in Israel. All of the in-flight movies had Hebrew subtitles. And though modern Hebrew is a bit different from biblical Hebrew, it was fun to try to read along and pick out words that were similar, looked, looked familiar. The one movie that I remember was a dinosaur film. And uh, as the huge green monster tromped its way into the scene, a single word popped up at the bottom of the screen. Roots. And I started to laugh. Because whether it's modern Hebrew or biblical Hebrew, roots means run. 
If Jacob's journey from Haran were made into a film, no doubt the Hebrew subtitle would read Roots. Run, Jacob. Run. Our patriarch, along with his family, his servants, his possessions have fled from Haran in the region of Padan Aram to get away from his double-dealing, deceitful father-in-law, Laban. Now all of the background, the preparation, and the initial stages of that flight from Haran are recorded in verses 1 through 21. And that's what we looked at last Lord's Day morning. Verses 22 and following, however, focus on Laban's pursuit. In this passage, Laban is the protagonist. It's Laban who pursues Jacob. It's Laban who accuses Jacob. It's Laban who searches for his gods. It's Laban who proposes the covenant. And though Laban chased his son-in-law and would have harmed him if he could, we see God in this passage, ever present as he promised, to protect his servant. The Lord was watching over his people, watching over this little camel caravan church as they made their way from what is today modern Syria, south and west, to the hill country of Gilead in today's modern Jordan. This little church was the only church in existence at its time. It was small. It, it appeared weak and vulnerable. And yet, it was seeking to follow and do God's work. The Lord had called his people to leave Herod, to return to the land of Canaan. And they were seeking to obey the word of God. And as they stepped out in faith on their journey, God was with them to protect them. Jacob in this passage experienced and enjoyed the promise of the Lord Jesus, who in Matthew 16 said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And it's that protection that you and I can experience and enjoy as well. Because the Lord sovereignly continues to protect his chosen people. Just as he did in days of old. Now as we dig into this passage this morning, I want you to see three ways in which God moves and acts to protect his people. First I want you to see that the Lord takes the initiative to protect his people. Jacob and his household had been gone for three days when Laban finally heard that they had left Haran and Padan Aram. Remember, he had been away shearing his sheep. But once he heard the news, he wasted no time in gathering his kinsmen and setting out in hot pursuit. He pursued Jacob's family for seven days and finally caught up with them in the hill country of Gilead. Just as he was in pursuit of Jacob, God was in pursuit of Laban. Because the night before they met, he came to him in a dream. And he said, Laban, when you meet your son-in-law, you are to say nothing to him, either good or bad. Now, there are three references to this dream in the passage. The initial time that it occurs here in verse 24. 
Uh, then Laban himself will refer to it later in verse 29. And finally, Jacob refers to it in verse 42. Do not say anything, either good or bad. Laban, do not use flattery. Do not use threats. Uh, this warning from God uh, was a prohibition of Laban doing anything to harass and harm his son-in-law. And it was, as Jacob will later point out, a rebuke from God. Now, this is not the first time this kind of thing has happened in the scriptures. If we go back to Genesis chapter 20, we discover there Abraham lying and concealing the true identity of Sarah when he was in Philistia. And so Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, took her for himself. But God came to Abimelech in a dream. And he said, you are a dead man because you have taken another man's wife. Now what we see in both of these instances is God confronting the sin and taking the initiative to deal with it. And that's the way he operates. Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, known popularly as Monty, was a senior British military officer during World War II, a controversial military officer. Uh, you either loved Monty or you hated him. There doesn't seem to have been much middle ground. But what you couldn't deny was his military skill. And one of the chief principles by which he operated was this. Engage the enemy on your terms. In other words, you don't wait for the enemy to determine when or where the battle will take place. You determine that. You decide that to your own advantage. You don't leave that up to the adversary. And that's exactly what God does here. He steps on to the battlefield. He confronts Laban and his sinful intent. He takes the initiative to put a stop to his evil deeds. Folks, God always takes the initiative to protect his people because he loves us. He takes the initiative in our election. We are chosen in him, Paul writes in Ephesians 1, before the foundation of the world. He takes the initiative in entering into a covenant with his son, saying to his son, I will give you these chosen people to redeem. And the son saying, I will redeem them by my blood. And Jesus takes the first step. Not to meet us halfway. But Christ takes the first step and all the steps from heaven to earth and from a stable in Bethlehem to a cross outside Jerusalem to secure our eternal salvation. But that's not all. God takes the initiative in giving us the Holy Spirit that night before the crucifixion when the Savior had gathered his disciples in the upper room. He had predicted his coming death. He was going to go away. What were they going to do? Could they solve their problem? No, but Jesus could. And he said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. But I will come to you. And when the Savior ascended on high, he poured out the Spirit just as he promised. And that same Spirit poured out at Pentecost is the same Spirit who lives in our hearts and who is in this place. But God also takes the initiative to equip us. The Lord never saves us and says, well, good luck. I hope it turns out well. No, he gives us the whole armor of God. So that we may stand against the wiles. 
in the great acts of redemption, God steps on to the battlefield. He takes the lead. He doesn't wait for us. Why? Because no one seeks after God. Romans 3.11. And so he takes the initiative. And he seeks. And he saves. And he keeps and protects. But you'll see here that the Lord not only takes the initiative to protect his people. But the Lord has the power to protect his people. Laban catches up with his son-in-law in their caravan in the hill country. And they camp. Two camps, one of Laban, the Aramean, and his kinsmen, and Jacob and his family. And it's that setting that provides the context here where God unfolds and, and reveals his remarkable power. We see here, first of all, his restraining power. Jacob wastes, or Laban rather, wastes no time in confronting Jacob. And he does so with a series of questions. If you look at the text closely, you'll see in verse 26, he first of all says this, What have you done that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? And then he switches from what to why. Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs with tambourine and lyre. And why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Notice those questions. That they are accusations of truth mixed with error. Jacob had tricked Laban. Or he had outwitted him to be sure. But had he driven away his daughters at the point of the sword as though they were captives of war? Absolutely not. They went willingly. They realized they had been shortchanged by their father time after time. And they said to their husband, whatever God says to you, do it. Had Jacob not allowed Laban to kiss his sons and daughters goodbye? Yeah, that, that was true. He hadn't. But do you think for a moment that Laban would have thrown a farewell party? Do you remember what happened the last time there was a party at Laban's? He switched Leah for Rachel under the cover of darkness. Could he trust that a farewell party would have been to his advantage? I don't think so. Mixing truth and error is not just the tactic of labor. It's what Satan does as well. Yes, he's the father of lies, but one of the significant ways in which he traffics in his lies is to throw in just a little bit of truth to make it seem more believable. And so Satan will come to you and say, you are a sinner. And he's absolutely right. But then he will tell you, you are hopeless. And that is a pernicious lie. You'll see here that the devil can even carry a Bible. When he went into the wilderness to tempt our Savior, he quoted scripture to him. The very living word of God. And yet, twisted it. And did not harm the Savior. But he twisted it to his own destruction. But there was one thing Laban had to be upfront and honest about. And that is the night before God had come to him. 
Laban said, Jacob, it is in my power. Literally, there is power in my hand to harm you. I can do it. But the God of your father came to me last night. And he said, don't you say a word, either good or bad. What was it that restrained Laban? It was the power of God's word. And the word of God is so powerful as that sharp double-edged sword that it continues to restrain the enemies of God. And the enemies of the church. In the 19th century, John Payton served as a missionary in the New Hebrides. These are islands in the South Pacific that are known today as Vanuatu. Payton faced all kinds of hardships and hostility. One night, the inhabitants of his village decided they were going to burn down the church that was next to his house. And it seems their intent was to kill him as well. Peyton writes about this in his autobiography. And here's what he says. They yelled in rage and urged each other to strike the first blow. But the invisible one restrained them. I stood invulnerable beneath his invisible shield. At this dread moment, a rushing and roaring sound came from the south like the voice of muttering thunder. They knew from previous hard experience it was one of their awful tornadoes of wind and rain. The mighty roaring of the wind and the cloud pouring in torrents awed them into silence. Some began to withdraw from the scene. All lowered their weapons of war. And several who were terror struck exclaimed, This is Jehovah's reign. Truly their Jehovah is fighting for them and helping them. Let us away. You see that invisible shield that protected Peyton was the invisible one who restrained the enemies. And that shield and that defender is our God. Here you see his restraining power. But you also see his providential power. Along with these accusations, Jacob, or Laban rather, switches his tactic and tone just a bit. He says, now, Jacob, I, I understand. Listen, I get it. You want to go home. You want to see your family. After all, everybody knows you're a mama's boy. Not like your brother Esau. You miss them. I get it. Just, just go on. It's okay. I'll go back to Heron without the grandkids, all by myself, lonely in my old age. It's fine. It's fine. But why did you steal my gods? Now, Jacob admits that he left because of fear. He feared the harm that Laban would inflict. But he pleads innocence with regard to the idols because he did not know that Rachel had taken them. Search, search all you want, Laban, and you put here in front of every one of us what's been taken from you. And so he starts his search. And Moses is a masterful storyteller because as you read these verses, the tension, the suspense builds. First he goes into Jacob's tent. I mean, that's the logical place to find them, right? There's nothing there. Then he goes to Leah's tent. Nothing there. He goes into the two servants' tent. Nothing there. And, and the tension's building because only Rachel and you and I know what's going on. And finally he goes into Rachel's tent. And she had taken the idols. She had hidden them in the camel's saddle. And as she sat there on the saddle, she said, Father, it, it, it's the time of my monthly cycle. Please forgive me. I, I, I can't get up. And so he searched, and he couldn't find them. Now, I want you to look at that scene 
from two vantage points. One that's polemical and one that's providential. On the polemical side, the argument side, this is an argument against the futility of Laban's idolatry and it is an exaltation of the power of God. Think about it for a moment. Rachel had taken these idols. She had stolen them. They were in her possession under her power. Kidnapping and human trafficking prey on the weak and the vulnerable. And here is a case of godnapping and god trafficking. She then hid them. They, they were small. They were easily concealed because ultimately they were insignificant. And then, if she was telling the truth, and we have no reason to assume she wasn't telling the truth, if, if it was the time of her monthly cycle and she sat upon them, they were ceremonially defiled. Now let's see. Weak, vulnerable, insignificant, and unclean. Does that sound like the kind of God you want to worship? And yet here is Laban searching for them. But from the providential perspective, you see God at work here, not to excuse Rachel's sin, but to protect his people. Wherever Laban searched, he couldn't find them. His gods were helpless. They could not come to his aid. They failed him. And idols always will fail you. They cannot offer you what they promise. They can't offer you meaning and significance and security and hope and peace. Whether that idol is another person, whether that idol is an addiction, whatever it may be, your idols, when the time comes, will not be found. They will fail you. I'm reminded of that anonymous gospel song about the broken cisterns. I sought the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, the waters failed. Even as I stooped to drink, they fled and they mocked me as I wailed. Now none Christ can satisfy. None other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy. Lord Jesus found in thee. Here we see God's restraining power. God's providential power. But we also see his intervening power. After the search ends up fruitless, Jacob is ticked off. He is fed up. He's had 20 years of this. And here's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And he begins to berate his father-in-law. I stole from you? Okay. Present the goods. Where are they? Where are the gods? What do you find here that belongs to you? And then he begins to recount the the suffering he had gone through, just as he had with his wives. He said, I served your father for all this time. Laban, 20 years I've been at this. 20 years I've borne the loss of the sheep that died under my care. For 20 years I have broken my back. I have suffered heat stroke and frostbite and insomnia all for you. And what have you done? Change my wages these 20 times. Fed up. Disgusted. And then he says, if it had not been for the God of Abraham and the fear of of Isaac. You wouldn't have sent me away with a party. 
you would have sent me away back across the Euphrates the same way I crossed it 20 years before, empty-handed, with nothing but a staff for a walking stick. Jacob's testimony here is the testimony really of us all, isn't it? When we look back over our lives as individuals or we look back over the history of the church, do not we have to say, if it hadn't been for the Lord, if it hadn't been for the Lord who stopped that accident from occurring, if it hadn't been for the Lord who helped me to detect this disease early on, if it hadn't been for the Lord who worked in our family and, and brought about salvation, we would have been scattered to the four corners. If it hadn't been for the Lord. Think about through the ages of the church's history under persecution, under threats, when the Bible was burned, when it was illegal to be a Christian, when you could be executed if you were caught with the scriptures. And yet, the church has been preserved and God's word has been preserved if it hadn't been for the Lord. That's why throughout the centuries, God's people have sung that 124th Psalm. I love the metrical version. Now Israel may say, and that truly, if that the Lord had not our cause maintained, if that the Lord had not our right sustained, when cruel men who us desired to slay rose up in wrath to make of us their prey, if it hadn't been for the Lord. God exercises his power to protect his people, his restraining power, his providential power, his intervening power. But I want you to see finally that in addition to the Lord taking the initiative to protect his people and exercising his power to protect his people, the Lord has the way to protect his people. And that way is through a covenant. If there's anything positive to say about Laban, it's that he's persistent. Even though he could produce no evidence of any theft or wrongdoing, he looks around at everything and he said, these daughters are mine, these sons are mine, these flocks of sheep and goats, they're mine as well. But he realizes he can get nowhere. They're at a stalemate. And so what he proposes is a non-aggression treaty. Let us make and Jacob readily agrees, and so they set up a pillar. This is just like the pillar that Jacob had set up back in chapter 28 at Bethel when he had his dream about the ladder. And so a pillar at Bethel, and, and now this pillar in the hill country of Gilead serve as the bookends of his sojourn in Haran. Then he had his kinsmen build a, a heap of stones, what we would call today a cairn. And this pillar in this heap were to serve as witnesses. Laban called it Yegar Sahadutha. That's the first Aramaic word, by the way, for you Bible trivia buffs. First Aramaic word in the Bible. It simply means heap of witness and, and the word galid. That's just the Hebrew term for the same, heap of witness. They called it that. They all call, also called it mitzpah, which means watch post. And here's the reason why. This heap of witness will serve as a witness between you and me when we're away from each other. And if you harm my daughters, if you take other wives besides my daughters, though we are not together, God will know it. It's by. God is watching. Have you ever seen a, a mitzpah necklace set? Now, this is a, a set of necklaces, the medallions of which are intersecting. They're usually in the shape of a heart, and when they're apart from each other, they look like a broken heart, and then you put them together, and they make one. And they have 
engraved on them the words of verse 49. The Lord watch between you and me when we are apart one from the other. And so when you're in love, you, you buy a set of these, you know, and you wear one, and, and you give your sweetheart one, and, and, and that's so sweet and romantic and sentimental, and it's just, oh, so wrong. <laughs> the Lord watch between you when we are apart the one from the other. In this context, I don't think that's exactly the sentiment you want to convey to your sweetheart. <laughs> because what Laban is saying, the Lord watch between us because I know you are a no good dirty rat and I don't trust you any further than I can throw you. And so girls, if your boyfriend gives you one of those, you just smile sweetly and say thank you and encourage him to read his Bible in context. <laughs> it's a witness. But these stone formations are also a boundary line. Jacob, I'll not cross this to harm you. You don't cross it to harm me. And so they enact the covenant. It's interesting here that in keeping with Laban's pluralistic, syncretistic theology. Uh, he refers to the God of Abraham, the true God, but, but also the gods of Nahor and the fathers, the pagan gods from back in Ur. But when Jacob swears this covenant, he will only swear by the fear of his father Isaac. He will only swear by the one true God. No doubt Laban swore by his gods. Now if he could only find them. As you look at this passage, you'll see that all the elements of a biblical and an ancient Near Eastern covenant are here. They are the terms of agreement. will not cross this line to harm each other. There's a sacrifice. Now we can pass over that pretty quickly. We assume so much about that, but let's not do that. Let's stop just for a moment. And remember that when covenants involved sacrifices, they were physical enactments of an oath. When you offered a sacrifice to establish a covenant, you were saying in essence, may it happen to me as has happened to this animal if I do not live up to the terms of our agreement. The slaughtering of the animal was a self-maledictory oath, calling down a curse on yourself if you aren't faithful. And then there is the oath itself. You swear by the name of your God, and that's followed by a fellowship meal to show that there is peace between the parties. You're in agreement. You're at one. Now, even though it was instigated by Laban, God used this covenant to protect his people. And covenantal safety is really the essence of the gospel, isn't it? Jacob readily agreed to this. Let's make a covenant. Yes, let's make a covenant. Jacob offers the sacrifice just as Jesus willingly came with the oath of promise because he could swear by none greater. He swore by himself and offered himself on the tree bearing the curse of the covenant that you and I had broken, the curse you and I deserved. And yet he willingly took it for himself. Jesus, like Jacob, not only willingly took the curse and made the sacrifice, but he invites us to come and dine. Listen to these words of the Savior in John chapter 6. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. 
As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Jacob and his kinsmen sat down to eat bread, but Jesus says, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And so Jesus' invitation to you this morning is come and die. In this passage, we have seen the Lord move in ways that are direct, powerful, and covenantal to protect his people. And he is moving in those same ways. Brothers and sisters, we live at a time in our country where Christianity is marginalized at best, hated and persecuted. But the church will triumph. The world may mock us, ignore us, pursue us, persecute us, even kill us. But the church will triumph. Now we will not triumph because of our organizational skill. We will not triumph uh, because of our marketing finesse. We will not triumph because of our cultural relevance. We will triumph. Because Christ is our head. The Apostle John wrote in Revelation 19, Then I saw the heavens open, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is our Savior. And this Savior is our shield and our defender. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we ask you today to give us faith in the protecting power of Christ Jesus our Lord so that we might triumph through his power. We ask in his name. Amen. Will you take your worship folder and please turn to our hymn section. <clears throat> what better way to conclude our service than begin by singing Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let's stand as we sing together.
Let me again invite you to stay for our time of fellowship. If you make your way out the front doors, you'll find everything set up out there. I hope you can stay, especially if you're visiting with us today. We would love to 
get to know you a little bit better and talk with you. Uh, we thank you for being here. Now let's go with God's blessing. Will you lift up your eyes and lift up your hearts and hear the word of God? Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.